Amen. Or is it just something that we do on Sundays because words are on the screen? Mm. You know, he tells us for two or three gathered in his name, he's here in the midst. Amen. So let's invite him once again as we sing that chorus. Believe it. Yeah, it's just me. Before you take a seat, please take a moment and greet your friends around you. <laughs> and now, if you will please be seated. Before I uh, open us in prayer this morning, I did want to take just a moment, first of all, to welcome everyone that's here in person and also everyone who may be worshiping with us online. Um, Pastor Monica will be back next Sunday, but she was out for continuing ed education in North Carolina, and she is at home today resting and recovering for that. So TJ is with us today, and he's going to bring God's message to us in just a little bit. Um, a few things I want to make sure that everyone is aware of. Just FYI, Lent starts Wednesday. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, Lent comes early this year. So we will have an Ash Wednesday service this Wednesday night, February 14th. The service will be at 6 p.m. and we will have a light meal in the gathering area at 5.15 beforehand. Um, please make sure that you are here to start Lent off in the right way and please bring your friends. Um, a lot of people would love to join in on this service but they may just not know about it or they may not have someone um, that they're connected to that they would feel comfortable coming with. So please make sure that you reach out and see if there's anyone in our community that would like to join us for that service as well. A big thank you to our youth this morning and to Christy and Tucker and David and all the adults who helped as well. It was a wonderful breakfast and we are thankful um, that our bellies are full and we got to fellowship and join together in that and thank you for the love offering donations to support our youth ministry as well. The other thing I wanted to make sure um, everyone knew about is out in the gathering area, you will notice that there's a little table. UMC Discipleship is sponsoring kind of a little service project for Lent um, for Children's Ministry and any others who want to join in. It's called Coins for Lent 2024. And there are jars out in the gathering area and there's a little calendar that goes with it. And for each day of Lent, there's a little task for you to do. Um, and for whatever that task is, the number you get that's the number of coins you put in your jar. And as you collect those throughout and they add up, you're gonna bring them back to church on Easter Sunday. And then some really patient people who are probably not me <laughs> are gonna count all those coins. And then we're gonna use those funds to donate to um, organizations in our community that support those who are unhoused or those who have food insecurity. Um, and it may be quite a bigger task than you expect. The first one I think is for every lamp in your house put a coin in your jar. I only have two lamps. Um, one of them is for every t-shirt in your house. Put a coin in the jar. So, um, yeah, if you need to like declutter and decrease the numbers, you've got until Tuesday evening to get that done. So we would just really appreciate anyone who would like to join in and support us with that. If you already have a jar at home you can use, feel free to use that one. If you need one, take one. If there aren't any left and you need one, I can get more, I promise. Uh, there is one other thing, sorry I forgot this one. Ladies and gentlemen, because even though it's technically a ladies Bible study, we open it up to the boys who are brave enough to join us. There will be a new ladies Bible study starting shortly. Um, we're thinking tentatively the end of February, but the official um, date will be announced soon. It will be on Wednesdays from 9 to 11. 
um, in the gathering area. It is a community study, not just a Methodist Ladies Bible study. It's open to anyone and everyone. Miss Jody Gammon will be leading this one. And it is called Devoted, 30 Days with Women in the Bible. Um, the books will be available from Deanna. They are $19. You can get them the first day of class. And just invite your friends. We always have a good time. We learn a lot of wonderful things about the Bible, and we eat really well, too. So if you want to join us, please do. Now, if you would join me in prayer this morning as we begin our worship service. Dear God, we're grateful <coughs> that you're a God who shows up. That when we are anxious and we are struggling with waiting and wondering of what we need to hear, of the prayers we need answered, that in that anxiety, you're the God who always shows up right on time. And that's all that needed, that's all that's needed of us is to be willing to trust you and willing to wait. And as long as we are willing, you will make it happen in your time, not ours, because your time is the time that is perfect and always right on time. As we go throughout this worship service, we ask that you please be with TJ as he brings your message, and that you help him deliver a message that is exactly what you would have us here today. And we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. If you will please stand and join me for the call to worship. Behind all things, behind the gray surface, there is a glory escaping, born of heaven, and belongs to heaven. We have come to see the glory. A glory-filled light that welcomes a more profound way of seeing things that transfigures the world. We have, we have come, come to witness, witness this glory. A glory that casts a spell of hope that sees the glory in the cross and life within death. We have come because we need the glory that gives hope. It is a glory that meets us here on this mountain, in this church. On this mountain where Jesus Christ, covered in the dust of the world, is caught up in the glory of heaven. We are here to experience the light, find the hope, feel the glory, to be covered in the dust of heaven. Welcome to the mountain.
ushers will come forward as we receive God's tithes and his offerings, please. Dear God, we thank you so much that you are giving God, a God that gives to us more abundantly than we can ever imagine. And as we give our gifts in return, we please ask that you please help us give just as abundantly back <clears throat> and use these gifts to do your work here on earth. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Scripture today is from 2 Kings 2, 1 through 12. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went down together to Bethel. The group of prophets from Bethel came to Elisha and asked him, Did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know, Elijah. Elisha answered, but be quiet about it. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Jericho. But Elisha replied again, As surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together to Jericho. Then the group of prophets from Jericho came to Elisha and asked him, Did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know, Elisha answered, but be quiet about it. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to the Jordan River. But again Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went on together. Fifty men from the group of prophets also went and watched from a distance as Elijah and Elisha stopped beside the Jordan River. Then Elijah folded his cloak together and struck the water with it. The river divided, and the two of them went across on dry ground. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken away. And Elisha replied, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. If you see me when I'm taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. As they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them, and Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, I see the chariots and the charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight, Elisha tore, the clo tore his clothes in distress. And in Mark 9, 2 through 9, six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up to a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. Then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. As they went back down the mountain, he told them not to tell anyone what they'd seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So, a little over a year ago, February the 4th of 2023, Catherine's horse had other intentions than what she had planned, and she fell off the horse, this horse, a horse, not her horse, a horse, someone else's horse, because her, her horse would have known better. <laughs> she broke her arm in several places, and... We all have our forms of worship. We all have our offerings that we give God. It comes as no surprise to you that Catherine's 
comes through her hands, from her heart to her hands, and that's how she offers her praise to God. For a period of time, she couldn't do that. She worked really hard to where she finally got her left hand working and was playing along with her left and got on the organ, if you recall, a few times and used her feet because she was still working on that arm. Well, fast forward, she's been playing beautifully for several months for us again with both arms. She's going to bring our special music today, uh, an arrangement of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And as you listen, I hope that you think of the words of that, but I also hope that you'll just recognize what good work God's done. Thank you. 
Well, whatever I say is going to be a letdown after that. <laughs> Probably could just go home. Uh, Catherine don't like it when y'all tell her how much something like that blesses you, so be sure you do a lot of that when you see her. <laughs> I wish I enjoyed doing anything as much as she enjoys playing that piano. It's fun to watch her play piano. Thank you. Well, happy Super Bowl Sunday. Probably ain't supposed to say that. That's probably some copyright infringement. I feel like a Hallmark movie broke out in the middle of the playoffs. Do y'all feel like that? <laughs> I mean, we're watching a love story unfold here in the midst of this playoff season in the Super Bowl today. Taylor Swift is flying from Japan right now to get to Las Vegas in time to watch her boyfriend play football. So... I don't really have a preference on who wins, I don't think. I feel like the 49ers should have Jerry Rice and Joe Montana playing for them still. So maybe I'm for the 49ers. So uh, we had a slumber party at our house last night. So if y'all notice, there's four young ladies asleep on the front pew. That's why. <laughs> One of them is really sleepy looking. The birthday girl is. <clears throat> All right, before I start, I'll tell you, I'll make a disclaimer. This got on my toes before it's going to get on yours. If it gets on your toes, it got on mine first. Um, it would be more fun to tell you something fun and to laugh and joke, but it's not. And it's like God just said, here it is. So here goes. So I have a group of people who report to me at work, and there's a group that report up under me, whatever. And the uh, a really good group of people, by the way, not dogging them at all. They're great. But... The one thing that really bothers me is for someone to bring a problem and not bring a solution, or at least a start to a solution. So I want to talk to you this morning about a problem that I think we as a church have, and I think we as a people have, but I'm going to try to help you give, give you some sort of solution to. If you ask me what the biggest problem we have as people is, I would say that we're selfish. And I can recognize that. In people, and the reason I can recognize it is I see it when I look in the mirror. I know it's I know it about myself. I'm selfish. I think we're born that way, in a lot of ways. Little babies know how to mine. They know how to say that, don't they? So, I think we're selfish about things with the church too. You know, I didn't get anything out of the sermon. I don't like the music. Uh, I don't like the light fixtures. I don't like the carpet. I don't like the seat cushions. I like the old seat cushions better. Um, we didn't get out on time. Somebody beat us to Acapulco today. <laughs> it's too cold in here. It's too hot in here. I'm not saying that because I've heard you say it. I'm saying it because I've said it. So it was me first. It's not about you. It's not about me. We're here to worship the God of the universe. And we're not here to consume that worship. We're here to be a part of it and to, to worship. We're not here to, to, be, to be the recipients of that. The work of the church, of being the church, is a team sport. It takes all of us. It's not just the staff, the hired Christians. It's all of us. So, all right, a little bit fun part here. So, um, I grew up watching the Chicago Cubs on WGN, and in turn, I watched the Chicago Bulls on WGN, and I, don't, I really hadn't watched NBA basketball much since the, those Bulls um, ceased to exist. So, I'm going to show some pictures, and you can just yell out who it is when I put the picture up there until one, and I'm gonna, there's a, only a small group of people who are allowed to answer. All right, let's see the first picture. Does anybody know who that is? Zach, don't ever say anything in church, and I knew that would get it out of here. Let's go to the next one. Cartwright. Bill Cartwright. Bill Cartwright. Bill Cartwright shot free throws like this with the ball up over his head. He was like eight feet tall or something. All right, the next one. John Paxson, right? Point guard. Who's the next one? Pippen. Scotty Pippen. Most of you recognize him. Let's do one more right here. So I put him on there because of some of my Vanderbilt fan people here. Purdue. Will Purdue. Will Purdue has on a mask right there. He is not a pretty man. He really is not a pretty man with that mask on. So I bought a pair of shoes one time at the same place Will Purdue bought his shoes at Boot Barn in Mount Juliet. He had a penny loafer. It was like this long. 
All right. Now, the next person that I want to put up there, you've got to be under 25 years old to say who it is. Michael Jordan. That's awesome, Madison. I knew you would know that because of Amanda, wouldn't you? Do? Michael Jordan, the GOAT, the greatest of all time, right? So, <clears throat> MJ, they took down the bad boys, the Pistons, in 1991 for their first championship. Go to the next picture. That's the starting five celebrating. That cap that John Paxson has on, I have one just like that somewhere at my mama's house. I know it's still there because she keeps everything, so it's there. I have that cap somewhere. So they were awesome, fun to watch. All you youngsters are going to talk about LeBron all day long. LeBron would not have fared well against the bad boys with the Pistons. You know, if they, were, they won six championships. They won a championship from 90, 91, 92, 93. They won 96, 97, 98 championship. If there was one thing negative about the Bulls, they would stand around and wait on MJ to make a shot. They wouldn't, they wouldn't if, they, if they faltered, it was because they waited on Michael to make the play. And he did a lot of times, but if that would be the problem. That's a thing that we have trouble with too. We want to stand around and wait on church staff or the preacher or somebody else to make the move for what we're, what we're called to do ourselves. Um, I came here to church the first time when I was probably 17 years old. Uh, that's been a minute now, 26 years. And yeah, I came because of Lindsay, and, but I came back for other reasons. There was a lot of you all that, brought, that drew me back. Let's go to the next picture. That one's tough. That's Quigs. Quigley, we had to bury Quigley a couple of weeks ago. She was the best dog ever. She raised our kids. That's little Ella. Quigley's probably eight there. Ella's probably like five or four or something. Little, aren't you? So I felt unconditional love from y'all, and we felt un unconditional love from Quigley. I think that's sometimes about the closest we get on earth is feeling that unconditional love that our pets share with us. I'm going to read uh, a, a paragraph or two from this book, Christmas from the Backside, Dr. J. Ellsworth Callas. We've been studying this in Sunday school. I'm among the first to admit that the church has vast numbers of another kind. I know we have a discouraging percentage whose religion is perfunctory and indifferent. But those who really give the church a chance, the church produces... Those who really give the church a chance, the church produces the finest and most admirable human beings you can ever hope to find. I confess that I'm sometimes distressed at the pettiness and half-heartedness I sometimes find among church members, but I'm far more often impressed by the kind, generous, godly people that the church has produced. I've now lived long enough to know that goodness isn't easy to come by or easy to maintain. Becoming a truly good human being is the most complex of all human enterprises. I rank it with the under four minute mile or swimming the English Channel. As a result, I'm surprised at how often the church produces such beauty of character. So we figured out our solution. We're naturally selfish, but what's the, what's the solution? So I, Dawn asked me if I was going to explain that scripture. And she asked me about uh, the Elisha and Elijah. That's a different day when I don't do that today. But Elijah was represented in the, in the transfiguration story. Elijah represented the, pro the prophets. And Moses represented the law. And Jesus was Jesus. And the glory of God was all around them. You know, we have that opportunity to have that spirit of God and that glory of God interacting with us every second of every day. So... That Mark uh, scripture, Mark chapter 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up on a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. Let's see the next picture. So that is Lone Peak. That is at Big Sky, Montana. I had a chance to go there a couple weeks ago with some guys and go skiing. I'm not that good, but you actually can ski off the top of that thing. There's, a, there's a, several ski runs coming down that thing. I wish I had a laser pointer to show you on there where they are. Um, so it says Jesus took them up to the top of a high mountain. That's like 11,000 feet higher than right here, the top of that is. Let's go to the next one. There's the view from up there. I did, I did go up there. I didn't have any intentions of skiing down. 
I rode the tram up there. It's $10 to ride the tram. So if you're ever there, ride the tram up and see what it looks like from the top of the world. Go to the next one. You can't see in this one probably as well as I would like for you to be able to, but way out in the distance, there's a little shadow of the top of another mountain, and that is Grand Teton. It's 105 miles from the top of Lone Peak to the top of Grand Teton, and it, you're up high enough that you can see it. I can't help but think that wasn't kind of like where Jesus took Peter, James, and John. So he takes them to the high mountain. He's transfigured before him, the glory of God's all around them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. And then comes Peter. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Why did he have to say anything? You, ever, you have people like that? They always have to say something all the time? Like, just shut up. Would you shut up? <laughs> I feel like Peter was that. Just, he didn't know what to do, so he talked. Um, and then right in the middle of all this, the glory of God could have just wiped them out right there on this spot. But Peter decides we need to start a building program. So the last thing we needed was another building. Then a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Being transfigured is, being, is different than being transformed. To be transformed means to become thoroughly or dramatically different. It's still a neutral term. Transformation may be thorough, but it's not necessarily better. But to be transfigured means to be elevated, to become thoroughly or dramatically more beautiful. So what did transfigured people look like and how do we recognize them? There were people here that when I came here when I was 17 years old that experienced that transfiguration and that change in their life. If you'll get a copy of the newsletter when you come out the door, if you haven't already read it, Monica's got an article in there called, Can I Get a Witness? It's, it's very, very good. Read it, please. There were people here who had that witness that they could give to me. And I could see the solution to my selfishness and my other issues. It was through Jesus. And that witness that they gave me through Jesus, I'm going to name some people, it's like I'm an award show, but I'm going to name some people and I'll forget people, but there are people that always come to mind when I think about this. Hazel Tooley is a, one of the first ones. She very quiet and unassuming, but she always had a nice note and something nice to say. Sarah Tinsley, Connie Baxter, Randy and Joanne James, I promise you without Randy James' witness, I wouldn't be standing right here right now. Promise. The way God softened his heart, and I saw that, had as much to do as why I, I wanted that in my life as anything else. Mary Leslie Wakefield, John and Judy Curzan. Everybody's like, yeah, Judy, sure. What about John? I don't know about John. John? <laughs> really? So Gordon and Sue, Gordon would tell, tell a story, and Sue would hold up a number of fingers the time she's heard it, and I think Lindsay's going to start doing that to me because I've told this story about John before, and I'm going to tell it again. And I always thought Gordon would tell stories, maybe because he didn't remember telling them, but he told you them again because he wanted you to hear them again. <laughs> so I had been coming here for a few weeks, and John called me on Friday night. That's still the earliest notice I've ever been given to be an usher. John called and said, will you help me with the offering on Sunday morning? And I said, yes, I will. And he said, when we get done, he said, you take the outside on the side you sit on, I'll take the aisle. And when you get done, get a $5 bill out of there for doing it. He was kidding. He was, he was joking. He was just, it's all, just joking. So, Lindsay, Lindsay's heard the story before. The reason I tell you that, though, is because it made me feel like a part of something. He did that for a reason. Uh, here's another funny John story. Kurt Bass called me one day, and he said, I'm looking for somebody to be a greeter at the funeral home, and I'm thinking about hiring John Cruzan. What do you think? And I said, I think that's the worst idea you've ever had. <laughs> John would be good at a lot of stuff, but being a greeter at a funeral home would not be at the top of the list of things that John would have been good at. If you needed somebody to fix stuff at the funeral home, then you should have hired John. That would have been great. I said, why don't you hire Sarah Tinsley? <laughs> Guess I should have been an agent. So those people 
that I mentioned and many, many others and many of you all are transfigured people. You're different. You're, you, you lay aside those things that are holding you back so that you can do more for the kingdom. When you're transfigured, you can do even greater things. What did Mark say? This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. In Luke, nope, not Luke, John chapter 14, verse 12. This is letters in red, so we know who's talking. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Jesus said that we would do even greater things than he had done because he was going to the Father. When he went to the Father, the Spirit came back, right? And dwelt among us and dwelt inside of us and lived in us. The glory of God was alive in us when that Spirit came back. In the Old Testament, the glory of God lived behind the veil in the temple. And the priest had to have a rope tied around his ankle so he could crawl in there and take stuff to the temple, take stuff to the, to the, to the glory, to the, to the throne room. 49 days from today is Easter Sunday. 47 days from today is Black Friday. On Black Friday, Jesus... Good Friday. I knew, I knew my Sunday school class would come, come through for me there. Good Friday. I said Black Friday this morning, so if you were here this morning, go back and change Black Friday to Good Friday. Gosh. Good Friday would be on that two days before Easter. And on Good Friday... Jesus died and the veil in the temple was torn in two so we don't have to have the priest with the rope tied around his ankle to go in there and do things for us anymore. We've got direct access to that. More from Dr. Kellis. I'm almost done. I worked with a guy and I won't say his name because I would uh, give up the person too much but he will say, I'm about to shut up and usually that means that he's going to talk for 20 more minutes. So... <laughs> <clears throat> That's why you'll find me in church every Sunday. Because while God can be found any number of places, and while God is not about to be fenced in by our expectations, the Bible makes clear that God is found by those who seek him. And at its best, the church is just that, a body of people who are seeking to please God and to do God's will. They're not perfect, but they've caught the message, and they're seeking to bring it to pass. <coughs> So I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 6, and before I do that, I want to tell you, uh, the, the Jewish people, the Israelites, they had a bunch of kings throughout their history. They only ever had about five that were any good, kind of like us with presidents sometimes, I think. Um, I didn't make a political statement, I promise you I didn't, that wasn't what that was about. Um, but they had, they had some good kings, and in this, in this chapter, one of the good kings had died, and they were really distraught and upset. So... Um, so he's going to talk about that and he's also going to the, the Hebrew uh, translation we don't have very many words in English so we have to use the same word for multiple things but in this, this chapter and verse um, he spells Lord capital L lowercase o lowercase r lowercase d and the thought is that that represents Jesus so the king had just died Isaiah was upset that the king had just died, but he's about to meet the king of kings. And this is like 400 years before Jesus was born. Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the end of their voices, at the sound of their voices, the doorpost and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. You ever been ruined in that sense? Like all of a sudden it's overwhelming because of the debt that you have that you can't pay? We all got debt. We all got a sin debt that we can't pay, no matter how little it is. Mine's bigger than some of y'all's, and some of y'all's is bigger than mine. But it's still a debt I can't pay. So I've been 
as he says, they're ruined by that before. To know that I have this debt I can't pay, but it's already been paid for me. We, we probably have sung, it is well with my soul, like 1,500 times since I've been coming to church here. Might not be a stretch, but it's a bunch of times. But there was one Sunday, we sung it, and I was ruined. Those words pierced me. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. Lindsay and I were in our bedroom yesterday morning having a conversation about something, and I said a wordy nerd. And Wyatt came running there and said, you said a bad word. And I said, yes, I did. You're correct. I was guilty as charged. I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among a people who have unclean lips as well. That's what this says. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. That was foreign to Isaiah. It's not foreign to us. We know that our sins were atoned for by the, by the death of Jesus. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. Are we willing to say, Here I am, send me? Monica's been into continuing education this week and she sent me something from that. So right now they claim that 25 to 30% of the population of the United States is um, religiously unaffiliated. The statistic that she got this week is 52 million people will be added to the religiously unaffiliated by 2050. That's if we don't do nothing. We don't need more examples or more Bible studies or more Sunday school lessons or more sermons. We just need to take hold of the power that we already have. The power that we already have is more than enough. Becoming people of God means we are to be transfigured. We are changed. Our eyes have seen the glory of the Lord and we can't just push it down and out of the way. Here I am, send me. This Easter season, what say we give up our me first selfish ways, turn from them, repent of them, and say to the God of the universe, here I am, send me. Amen. I'm going to invite you, if you would, to please stand. We're going to sing two verses <clears throat> of I Surrender All, verses 1 and verses 3.
It's 11 o'clock. You can get Doc a Poco on time. <laughs> um, this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. There'll be a Ash Wednesday service here at 6 o'clock. 5.15, there'll be dinner. And I'd almost guarantee you that Monica is going to tell you at that service to give up something for Lent, but also to take up something and to start doing something new. And I would ask that, I'll tell you what mine will be. I want to give up my selfishness and I want to pick up the spirit of God and take that to those that are around me and to be able to share that and that witness. Maybe you consider to do the same. Have a great week.